So I've been trying to make sense of the text comments that were added to the strange loop video I posted a few days ago. Um, and it's it's difficult, you know, when we have such a small space to really say something meaningful or that, that at least is understood uh, by all parties involved. But it seems like the main question has come down to what is experience? Um, and I think this is the wrong question, or it's it's an impossible question, because experience isn't an isness. It's not a something you can break down into essences. It's existence itself. So it's pre isness, pre essence, pre conceptual. Experience itself is is non dual. You can't put it into a category until after the fact, until you use, uh, Aaron was, was referring to it as transcendental logic, or until we, it's basically, until you conceptualize it, until you intellectualize it, after you have an experience, you put it into a box and say, this is what that experience was. And yet, the experience that I'm trying to describe is what you're still having, even while you're conceptualizing this prior experience. You're still in the now, saying, you're still here, where you are, and there's no words or concepts that you could describe that with. It's just what there is before there is anything. And that, I think, is the basis of all cognition. You start there, even though it's not a beginning point or an ending point. It's just, it's the ever-present ground. Um, so I was looking at some definitions of concept. Um, one of them says, an abstract or symbolic tag that attempts to capture the essence of reality. Uh, another one says, a concept is a unit of thought. Um, a concept is an idea. Um, a concept is an abstraction or symbol that represents similarities or common characteristics in phenomena. A concept is the basic element of thought. It is a physical material storage of information in neurons or electronics. All the concepts in memory are interrelated. They form a web, a net. So the meaning of a concept then is context dependent. It means what it refers to. It means its connections. So it has no intrinsic meaning. So that if our concepts are going to make sense, they have to be coherent and connected and they have to form a whole. So every, there's the various conceptual schemes that we can apply to the world. We can be, just as an example, you know, a mechanist, and we have this conceptual projection of how we break the world up into categories, or we could be a vitalist. We have a different uh, conceptual mechanism, or a conceptual uh, categorization of what the world is. Um, or we could be a theologian, and we could break it all up into you know, good and evil deeds, we could, we could, there's all these different ways of conceptualizing the world, and they only make sense in terms of themselves, um, in terms of their, their existence as a, their own form of life, and you can't transfer from one form of life to another form of life, because the concepts don't apply to the same web of ideas that form a coherent whole, a coherent explanation, um, and I think, I mean, I commented on this too, I think this shows that before we ever conceptualize something, there is this unified field of of, of experience that is non-dual, that is that is empty. And um, Nermonics was was a couple times pointing out, you know, the simple fact that how can I deny that I'm sitting in front of a computer screen with all these objects, and and, and when I walk down the sidewalk, that I'm I have to know where I'm going and all of this. And um, this, I think. You know, there's there's a there's a one of the um, most famous propositions from um, Nagarjuna's work, Buddhist philosopher, is that emptiness is not other than form, and form is not other than emptiness. So while all of these forms appear in our environment, they are empty because I know one form only because I know other forms, and they are combined in this web of meaning. But I, I can't just differentiate one form. There's no such thing as one form or one concept. 
to be one concept, there must be many concepts that, that surround it and give it context. Otherwise, it's meaningless. It's empty. So the fact that there are forms and that their whole is empty allows each individual one to have a meaning to me. And so while it's, it seems plainly obvious that I experience a world of forms or a world of concepts, each one of those forms or concepts only appears as a separate identifiable form or concept because of the unity of the whole. And so there really are no separate concepts, no separate objects. I understand the computer on the desk, on the floor, in the house, on the surface of planet Earth, all together. They only make sense together. There's no sense to be made out of just computer. Just the, the physical location of computer itself has no meaning to me. It, it would just be floating in, in an empty void, as you said. Uh, we also were discussing whether categorization implies separateness, or whether it necessitates separateness. And um, it doesn't necessarily, but I think it, it, it's easy, it's very easy to fall into that, because as soon as, I mean, the basic act of categorizing something is making a distinction. Um, you're saying this is separate from that, they don't mix together, there's no blurriness. You know, this is one concept and that's another concept. And the whole idea of these concepts, at least for Hofstetter, concept means is identical to representation. So I have a representation of some object in the world, therefore I come to know something separate from myself. I and the object are not one. The knower and the known, in order to have a concept, must be separate. The known is the concept, and the knower is the conceiver of the concept. And so that dualism, whenever you're going to talk about concepts, it seems to me that there's always a dualism implied. Because you can't just have concepts interacting with concepts, symbols interacting with symbols. And I mean, Hofstadter tries to get around this by saying, well, when the symbols start to refer to themselves, it appears as though there's a conceiver or it appears as though there's an internal experience of the external manipulation of symbols. But I don't understand, I mean, that, that doesn't, I don't understand how that happens. That, to me, doesn't, it's not a coherent explanation, because it's, it's, it doesn't explain anything. It's still this objective third-person perspective, which is, I mean, f from that perspective, it's valid, and I can't, I can't find a hole anywhere in his argument. But it's still a dualism, because he wrote this argument. He understands his argument, his theory. And that understanding of the concept is what's left out of, of the concept, of his theory. And I don't know how to get around that. And I could just be not understanding his theory, but I, I mean, I don't know what else I'm missing. It's a strange loop, but just saying it's strange, to, I mean, I agree it's a mystery, but I don't think that's what Hofstadter's implying when he says it's a strange loop. He's saying, no, it's no mystery. It's no mystery, it's just an illusion. And in that sense, it's, a, it's all of a sudden unimportant. Or, or this, this mysterious gap between the third-person objective physical stuff of the brain and the first-person immaterial experience of consciousness is not a problem anymore. Or it's, it's, it's like we've solved that issue, and I don't think we have. That's still a mystery. It's not just that the first person is an illusion. It's that the first person and the third-person perspective somehow can't be brought together. And by, by saying they can't be brought together, I don't want to sound like I'm a dualist. Um, I just think we cannot conceptualize a bridge between the two. Because the bridge, the conceiver, can't be a concept. The one who makes the concepts can never be conceptualized. So the real issue here is if, if we want to solve the hard problem of consciousness... We have to transform our understanding of, of experience. 